Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to be talking about industrial cybersecurity, why it matters, and what should you consider about it. So today with us we have a resident expert, Mr. Santa Thangaville, with us. Hey Santa, how are you? Doing great, Chris. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, before the internet brought almost everything universally connected, industrial security was different than what it is today. So now you have to be concerned with far more than just the physical protection of your resources, right? All these devices face a broad range of threats, and they're invisible sometimes. And Santa, you're going to help us understand what some of these threats are. So can you explain for the listeners that may be new, when we hear the term industrial cybersecurity, it sounds kind of scary. What is it? Sure. Sure. So uh, like you said, a lot of the times the security means safety, safety of the equipment, uh, physical safety, physical security. Those are the things that were discussed in the past. But in the last five years or 10 years, as more and more devices on the plant floor are getting intelligent. By intelligent, I mean everything is connected to the Ethernet from all device net, control net or anything. They are moving to Ethernet and they can talk to the corporate network devices. So the more intelligent the devices get, the more secure it has to be. So these devices which control the critical production environment, if they gone rogue, imagine the devastation it can cause if somebody tries to hack in and tries to change a parameter within a motor and how much it's going to affect the production or even the safety of the people over there. So the safety is not just the physical safety anymore. It's the security that's built into these devices. Right, right. And I guess you have two types of things you're protecting from too, like the intentional and then accidental things that happen, right? Yes, that is right. So intentional are mostly outsiders, people like hackers, non-ethical hackers, I would say who is uh, trying to get access to the data uh, of the production environment, which can be millions and millions of dollars worth, or they are trying to get a plant down uh, for fun, because a lot of people do that. A lot of non-ethical hackers do that nowadays. And uh, these are the things that are done from the external side. And the accidents are mostly internal, or it can be collateral damage. So for example, the recent ransomware hits, uh, they are targeted of the IT uh, Windows XP machines, but they somehow got penetrated through the firewall and reached the plant floor and affected the production environment, causing them to lose lots of data. So those are accidental collateral damage because they are not the intended host for the attack. And other uh, other kinds of accident is any employee who has uh, malware on the USB drive that he or she uses at the home, then they actually plug it into the production environment for copying an important file or something like that. The malware gets into the production environment and it goes uh, through the firewall and affects the whole production environment. Gotcha. Very good. Very good. Now, now when I think cybersecurity, you see a lot of these commercials out there now just protecting your identity, your security threats. You know, everybody's doing the, their own personal VPNs now just to protect their own information, right? What's the main differences when we're thinking about cybersecurity from a personal standpoint versus the industrial point of view? Sure. From a personal standpoint, mostly the cybersecurity threats are because of the financial motives or money motive. So if somebody is trying to access your personal information, it's mainly for the money, right? So uh, they are not going to have any critical data from you or anything like that. But if they try to get into your bank account, they can uh, take money out of it or they can convince you to give your card number to them. Uh, There are different kinds of things that they can do. But everything is mostly focused on money. But if a bigger organization or if a bigger manufacturing facility is targeted, they are mainly targeted for the data and the documents. So uh, a famous uh, cookie manufacturer, the, the biggest thing that they could lose is the recipe to their competitors or to the outside world. So till today, 
Coca-Cola have their uh, recipe as a secret to the outside world. So similarly, a lot of the manufacturers, their recipe is more than money for them. So these attacks are intended to get that data out of their plant machines. So that's the biggest difference I see between the personal and the uh, larger uh, organization targeted attacks. That's very good, Sam. I'm thinking that down that road, you always typically think financially, but there's uh, different tentacles within the industrial environment with the recipes, like you mentioned, and, you know, just imagine just giving away that, that Coca-Cola secret recipe, you know, what that would do. So uh, I'm so glad you, you broke that down for us. And, and inside these plants that we support, you have the IT and you, and you have the OT. Does cybersecurity have different approaches based on, you know, what network you're engaging with or the groups you're engaging with there? It is definitely. There are two different approaches for the IT and the OT. A lot of our customers on the OT side, they don't have a networking expertise or I would say specifically network security expertise. So most of the control engineers or the process engineers, they don't have expertise on how to secure their network. So if they're installing a new machine, they don't know how to protect that from the vulnerabilities that is existing or uh, protected from the outside hackers or, or, or the outside world. But the IT, they always have the policies implemented. So they are ready for the upgrade or ready for adding a new office buildings or adding another uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, laptops or telephones or wireless access points. So they are always ready for adding more and more. And another thing is, even though the IT is more ready for the cybersecurity problems, they are okay with having their machine down for even one day. So, so somebody tried to hack a particular office network and they succeeded and the network is down for two days, the IT doesn't really care much on it. I mean, they'll just drop a ticket to fix that problem and after two days, they'll fix the network and it's back on. So things can wait on the IT side, whereas on the OT side, losing one minute of production is really crucial. So the cybersecurity uh, has to be more important on the OT side than the IT side because it can result you in lots of thousands of dollars. Absolutely. You know, Sam, I was doing some research just prepared to, to sit down with you and I ran across the, the CIA triad and it talks about the priorities of IT versus OT. And from yes. I, that CIA is confidentiality, integrity, availability. And, and from IT, that's the ranking, but it actually flips from an OT standpoint, where availability is most important, integrity second, and then confidentiality is third. And I think that really speaks to where you just were going. I mean, from an OT standpoint, you can't yes. wait two days. <laughs> you know, you have to have that equipment up and running now. Yep, exactly. You're spot on. I mean, uh, I forgot to mention the CIA triad, but yes, IT always have the CIA and uh, the OT always have it as AIC. They care least about the security on the OT side. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad we we're able to walk down that. I think that really opened, opened my eyes to, to really think through, okay, how does an IT person think versus how does an OT person think? And not to say either one of them's wrong. They're just, they live in different worlds. So, you know, marrying them together and, and just understanding will help bridge some of that gap. So thank you so much for that. And, and I think you even mentioned earlier a ransomware attack. First of all, what is that? For our listeners who may not understand what ransomware is, and how could that be impacting a facility in the future? You know, what can we do to prevent it? Sure. 10, 15 years ago, most of the malwares attack a machine and makes it not usable. So if a virus or any other malware attacks a particular machine, it will bring it down. So you have to reboot the machine or reinstall all the applications and get it back up and running. So the unique thing about ransomware is it doesn't attack the machine, it attacks the data and encrypts it. So if you have like uh, hundreds of gigabytes of uh, data or crucial production data in your environment, and if a ransomware hits that server, it automatically encrypts those data into one big uh, folder and locks it with the password. And that password is only known to the attackers. So you gotta give them the ransom to get the password to unlock your data and retrieve it back. So that is what called as ransomware. Right. So it's nothing actually taken. It just makes you unable to use what you already own, which has to be yeah. extremely frustrating. Yes, that's the biggest difference. Yeah. So uh, you can't retrieve the data. You can't uh, 
you, you can still restart the system, but your data is still lost. Uh, the data is still encrypted uh, without the password. Uh, you won't be able to retrieve it. If you try to retrieve it without the password, they'll have the codes to delete the data automatically. So you lose the data either ways. Right. Now, from a from an industrial standpoint, are there devices that pose a potential cyber threats, you know, more versus other types of devices? Just trying to give the listeners an idea of, of, of where to be most concerned. Any device that is uh, out of date in terms of firmware, is the biggest threat for the uh, manufacturing facility. So if you have a device that's running the firmware that it shouldn't be running because uh, the vendors release firmware every once in five months or six months or one year to fix the bugs in the previous firmware versions. But if you don't keep up with the vendors, then you are increasing the vulnerabilities of that particular device over the years. So you got to keep yourself updated on the firmware of any device. Very good. That really hadn't crossed my mind, but that's, thank you so much for bringing that out. And another term we often hear about and think about from the OT standpoint is the uh, demilitarized zone and the industrial DMZ zone. So why does the industrial manufacturer need an IDMZ? Previously, the IT and the OT operated as two different entities or two different organizations within a single company, but not anymore. As we are moving into the future, more and more things are getting connected. The CEO or the executive level people wanted to see the daily data of what their production environment looks like. To achieve that, you got to connect everything. The IT and the OT convergence need to happen. But it cannot happen just like that. You cannot just tie the OT network to the IT network and be done with it. You got to have a demilitarized zone between the IT and the OT and call it as an industrial demilitarized zone. The reason you need that is, for example, if a hacker tries to attack a corporate office and they target on the office desktops that are at the enterprise level and they attack it, and if they successfully do that, these malware can penetrate its way to the factory floor if there is no proper segregation or if there is no proper IDMZ in between the IT and the OT. So some of the ransomware attacks, like I mentioned, are collateral damage for the data that they are trying to access at the IT level. These OT machines got affected by that. Okay. So if you get that IDMZ set up and you have that secure network, does that fix your potential problem for, for good? It won't fix your problem for good. Any any security practice will not fix your problem for good. Uh, security policies is not just a practice, it's just a lifestyle. So you have to keep updating your security policies for the latest uh, and the greatest threats that exist in the outside world. You have to keep your devices up to the date. You have to increase the secure policies on a day-to-day basis. So Security is not just a one-time thing, so it's an ongoing process or lifestyle that you have to keep on doing. It kind of sounds like this is a, a journey for industrial cybersecurity. If you want to get on top of it, you, you really have to focus in on and zone in to limit those risks and those threats and, and to be able to handle them when they do come. So anything from a good practice standpoint that you would recommend to the industrial end user who's out there listening right now who maybe is in charge of, of managing this? Sure. A lot of the times the industrial cybersecurity is uh, not taken good care of and uh, the OT engineers are not really cared of their uh, security of the machines. So it's a lot of the times the IT tries to push it down to the OT level. You got to keep this secure. You got to do this. You got to do that. Force policies onto them. But that's has to come proactively from the OT side, like the maintenance manager on the plant manager. They need to be really concerned about the threats that are existing out there. Even their carpet is targeted, they could be a collateral damage and get affected by the, the attack. So they need to be proactively starting to think about this uh, cybersecurity journey. It cannot be done within a year or within a few months. So it's an ongoing process. So they have to have the proper expertise on their side, on the OT side to secure their network, and they have to start on their cybersecurity journey by implementing policies on the OT floor. So it sounds like it's a real focus. And there's challenges, there's hardships in implementing. It sounds like there, there just could be a lot of attention that needs to be taken to it from maybe from a from a cost standpoint. What what prohibits maybe some of these facilities moving forward? Is it is it 
uh, an expensive journey? There are two things to consider. One is uh, expenses, like you mentioned before. Uh, yes, I, I agree. Implementing your proper cybersecurity practices with the necessary hardware and securing your environment does take quite a bit of expenses upfront. But once you do that, you are saving your network from the hackers and the outside world so that you are saving lots of money from the unprotection or, or the downtime environment. The, the second thing is... Uh, Implementing cybersecurity policies or securing a network that's producing a product 24 by 7, 365 days a year uh, is a little bit difficult. So they have to wait for the downtime to implement certain policies or to install certain hardware so that they want to see if that's affecting their production in any way or not. So not all the production environment can implement cybersecurity policies or secure their environment while they are up and running. So they have to wait for the downtime. So these are the two things that I see as a hurdle for them to uh, hesitate and going towards the ICS journey. Right. It also sounds like there's a lot of, of dedicated resources just to manage this from a plant standpoint. We've heard titles like the Chief Information Security Officer. Those are types of roles that are out there right now. What are these type of roles focused on and how do they affect the ICS? Yeah, the Chief Information Security Officer, the CISO, is more recently developed role in the last uh, 10, 20 years, I would say, when the Ethernet started booming. So was that there before that? So this particular role, uh, the officer needs to make sure that their whole company is secure and they have the policies implemented in the all ways possible. And the, the officer should keep updated on the latest threats that's happening in there and uh, try to secure their company at all costs. Very good. So, I mean, it definitely sounds like full-time job, a lot of responsibility. When things go right, it's all gravy, but when it goes wrong, it sounds like it's probably a tough day at work, right? Yes, absolutely. Gotcha. No, no different in your role, right, Santa? Yep. So, I am a, a network security and information product manager. So I deal with a lot of networking part as well. And along with that, I deal with the security as well. But the, the CISO role, he is more, uh, he or she is more focused into only security. So they are always focused on the security aspect of any device or any particular section of their plant or the office floor. Okay. Now, from a security standpoint, let's, let's talk about industrial framework for a second. You know, why is that important? And maybe just walk through the different layers of security from that standpoint. Somebody who is new to implementing security policies to their plant floor, they should start off somewhere, right? So industrial framework are the standards provided by several organizations like NIST and uh, IEC and so many other organizations. So these frameworks can be implemented for the plant floor, which section needs to be secured more or which needs to be acted upon immediately, the priorities of securing them, those kind of things are provided in the industrial framework. And the different layers of security is uh, like, physical security is the first layer. Any, anybody could easily fix it. So basically, if you block off unused ports on your switches or routers or your laptops or any anywhere, if there is any, any open port is there, if you block it off by having a port lock with a key, that's the first level of security. Similarly, you can move on to the software level by blocking off several IP addresses, by blocking off outsiders. Also, you can have uh, security based on the type of protocol you're using. So if there is a machine that's using only SIP protocol for the protection, and if you see a different protocol within that machine, then definitely somebody from outside is trying to get access to the machine. So you can easily block it off. So these are the several levels of security that you can implement within your machines and your factory floor. Okay. So Santa, we, we often hear a lot of times as well about the cloud. And should that be a concern from us from an ICS standpoint? And just how does that affect the industrial cybersecurity? It is definitely a concern. Whenever we say cloud, we uh, tend to forget uh, that the cloud is accessed through the internet. So the, the cloud is not a problem. Most of the cloud that exists today are really secure, but the medium or the mode of accessing the cloud is still the internet connection. So that is not often secure. So that's why people try to establish a secure remote connection between the cloud and the plant floor. But still, there are people out there who are most notorious to get access to the data in between. So 
if you're talking about cloud, you should always be concerned about the security, whether the, the cloud is secure or the data that is transmitted from my plant floor to the cloud server is safely going there or if somebody is trying to tap it in between or if the cloud is itself is compromised, do you have a backup somewhere else? Uh, so these are the things to consider when you're going for cloud. But you cannot avoid it because people are going towards cloud almost any website or anything that you see on internet that is hosted on a cloud somewhere. It's not hosted on a local server. So it, it can be from Amazon, it can be from uh, Microsoft Azure, or it can be from Google. So it, it's hosted somewhere in the world. Nobody can uh, find it out, but it's always in the cloud. Right. Yeah. I mean, everywhere you look, it, like you mentioned, any website, any service from many of the vendors we support, it's all cloud-based servers, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing local anymore. It's just kind of the way the world's turning. So it's definitely good that you, you tie that together from a ICS standpoint, because that is something that should be evaluated. So Santa, we call this eco ask why. So I'd definitely like to get to the why in every one of these that we sit down and do. Why does understanding and, and having a plan to stay on top of industrial cybersecurity matter for that industrial end user that, that may be listening? Sure. The, the main thing is uh, we started implementing Ethernet on the devices in a much faster pace than we started considering the security. So we did not study or work towards the security as much as we do on getting the devices connected to each other. Almost any device on the plant floor, uh, even the sensors, or the I.O. or the drives can talk to the highest level of device like the switches, routers, or firewalls possible. So when we are going in such a phase of connecting devices together, uh, we should really stop for a minute and start considering going into the more secure journey of manufacturing. Absolutely. We want our plants up. We want them safe. We want them reliable. Uh, we don't want them coming down for things like this. So, Santa, you brought just so much value really broke down industrial cybersecurity and, and why it matters. So I really thank you for your time, for all the information that you brought to our listeners. So thank you so much for your time today, Santa. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.